Okay, so we are done with the welcoming um, presentation. Um, the first speaker doesn't really need an uh, introduction. He's uh, pretty famous and he's the mastermind behind uh, many of the <laughs> open air developments. So please help me to welcome uh, Thomas Bill. <laughs> okay, good, good, good morning, everybody. My name is Thomas Beale. Um, I'm going to talk about. Oh, hang on. Let me put it into presentation mode. That would be smart, wouldn't it? No. So, that's who I am. Um, originally, I'm the, on, on the engineering side, so I usually just put that slide up just to make sure that people understand I'm not a, a, a medical doctor. So lots of people in open air are on the clinical side, I'm on the engineering side. Uh, who here has knows anything about open air, or actually no, who, who never doesn't know anything about open air of the audience here today? Can you put your hand up? Ah, this one, <laughs> one, one poor victim. <laughs> That's good because the way he's arranged the, uh, the program, it's kind of upside down with uh, the most, well, a little bit complicated and not, not the most basic thing first, but it's, maybe it should be more fun like that, so <laughs> hopefully it will be. Um, so I'm going to talk about something called task planning. I'm just going to give a little bit of justifications. It's a little bit simple, but just to sort of give you um, the key reasons why we uh, well, well, why do we write a specification about planning? It's a bit clinical workflow, clinical process, so these are the keywords. We happen to call it task planning because we didn't want to use the word workflow because if we use the word workflow, then everybody's going to go, ah, you're a competitor of BPMN and all this usual stuff, which we are, but we, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll tell you about that later. I was just at the OMG meeting uh, in Nashville in the US and we, uh, I was, um, one of the uh, people invited to help launch the BPM Plus community in OMG, so actually we have good links with them. Anyway, so let's go. Um, from the clinical point of view, process is actually the main organizing principle. We spent most of our time to date in open air talking about data and thinking about what does the data look like and how do we get data from different places and how do we semantically mark data so we can understand it. So. Uh, basic sort of concept, continuity of care is an organizing concept from a process point of view. Patients, as we know, is just a normal thing, are visiting uh, lots of different provider facilities in the course of an episode of care. And in each of those facilities, we have all kinds of systems running, IT systems, and in those systems, all kinds of data are being created, and there are appointment systems and booking systems and all, all kinds of things. Most of this is not standardized. Most of it doesn't communicate with each other. There's a little bit of communication and interoperability uh, going on there. So just I'm just thinking in terms of the process of care from a consumer point of view, and also from a clinical point of view, what, what, is there, what, what do clinical people want? What do patients want? A nice, smooth way for the IT to help the clinical professionals track the care process from the initial request to some sort of resolution. It's a quite simple thing from a, a, a consumer point of view, right? So let's just have a think about some semantic levels in, to do with the process. So professional care view, uh, you can think of uh, clinical guidelines and care pathways. So they're models of care that have been worked out from clinical research based on um, evidence and studies of what the relationship between outcomes and original practice has been in the past. And we look for the good outcomes and try to refine what are the good practices and eventually some guidelines get developed. So if you look on a site like nice.org.uk, I don't know what the um, equivalent site in Spain would be, but every country has a lot of these different repositories, you're going to find a lot of guidelines. So you can see things like uh, the third one there, maybe you can't read, but it's initial management, oh, sorry, um, confirmed diagnosis of stable angina or continue investigations. It's a whole guideline. If you click on that, you end up in a, a big thing. 
you can see some other things about stable angina. So this is, I don't know how many hundreds of these there are, there's a lot in this particular repository. Uh, there's a few more that just gives you an idea. Uh, acute coronary syndrome excluded ways um, of doing assessments for various kinds of things and so on. So I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with guidelines as a general um, artifact in clinical practice. So there's a little bit of um, logical workflow in a guideline. Uh, it's essentially a kind of decision tree of some kind. Well, if you look at it carefully, it's mixed actions, so doing some sort of examinations and then deciding based on observations and results what to do next. So you can see there's a decision point in there which distinguishes between typical or atypical angina, which is the straight through path, and non-angina chest pain. So that's one of the basic things that doctors try to do. If you come to the ED for chest pain, they go, oh, okay, you go in there first. And we do a lot of testing, make sure you haven't got raised ST segment on the ECG or troponin or whatever, and they do a lot of other tests, and hopefully they figure out that maybe you didn't have chest, uh, didn't have angina, which would be a good thing. There's a few, uh, there's a particular uh, guideline, chest pain of recent onset assessment and diagnosis. So this is just a thing that clinicians could use in a routine way. Now, you start looking at the detail and you can see a lot of steps in here. Uh, I think I counted the steps in this one. There's about 200 um, you know, detailed paragraphs to read, all of which in theory have come, well, no, not in theory, in, in reality, they have come from research. You can see after each paragraph there's a date, like 2010 or um, 2010, I mean to 2016. So these things are being maintained over time. So what really is one of those things? It's a model of care for a condition. It's a decision tree, or it, it contains decision tree, uh, uh, decision trees in amongst actions based on research results. It's not a patient care plan. Each patient is a phenotype and life history. So uh, clearly, the typical situation of a, a patient with particular complaints is that there could be more than one guideline that applies. It could be a person who's diabetic and is experiencing chest pain. It could be a, a pregnant woman who's uh, experiencing symptoms that may be sepsis and so on. It's a clinical level idea as well. It doesn't tell the doctor to go and do um, obvious things. It doesn't tell the doctor how to order a CT scan. The clinical professionals know how to do these kinds of things, obviously. So a care pathway has to be interpreted in some way to be usable for a real patient. And one question is how that gets done. So I've already showed you, you can, I'm sure a lot of people here know that guidelines generally may have many, many steps. One of the things that it's easy to forget is that guidelines are under constant maintenance, just like software, so they keep changing. Uh, the uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, SCAD, was a condition that wasn't probably in the literature until about 10 years or 15 years, I, I don't know exactly when, but now it's considered to be probably one of the more normal causes of certain kinds of heart attacks. So that's just uh, normal medical research uh, acting as it does, and guidelines have to get updated to take account of these new uh, understandings. Also, guidelines change because of things like costs of um, certain types of tests for, and it's easier to do a, a CT because less radiation in modern machines, they're higher. Um, uh, higher precision and so on. One of the important points is that clinicians are only hu human and they need help, especially in complex uh, cases. So there's lots of arguments to computerise guidelines. Most guidelines today are just PDFs, paper. So here's a picture just to sort of establish the, uh, the logical semantic levels. Guideline we can think of as, as clinical steps, uh, but there's a process level at which we have logistical steps that we need to actually perform. Do an ECG, do a, uh, a CT scan, coronary arteries, 
there might be a delay. Uh, so, or oh, sorry, the, 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 that one there is is to uh, establish the appointment. We have to wait some time, at least in the UK. Then you have your CT scan. Uh, the radiologist radiologist does a report. So, a single line in a paragraph in a guideline might have a lot of logistical steps, probably more than what I've shown. So there's, at some level, if you want IT support, you have to think, well, probably the clinician, of course the clinician knows how to uh, order an appointment or do whatever, but because they're doing it for lots of patients, they need help to remember, did I already order an appointment for that particular patient? So we, we would like to see uh, what has been done what I have, have I still got to do for this patient, for that patient? The clinicians are seeing multiple patients every single day, of course. So clinical um, view is to, well, would be to uh, have a picture of the whole process, to know where we are in the process right now, who's taking care of the patient right now, what's the status of all of the orders and interventions that are going on, uh, at least the important exam results, notes, etc. So. It, from a clinical point of view, this is just absolutely normal. It's, it's like it's not asking for anything strange, uh, but it's actually quite a challenge for the IT layer. So we have the guideline level. From our point of view, if we want to provide IT support, we need something which we're calling the plan level, which is more of this logistic uh, level of, of logistical steps. Now, it, when I say logistical, it might be clinical steps, for example, single administrations of drug, uh, drugs during a chemotherapy uh, um, administration uh, for uh, a cancer patient. So any single clinical action, if we put them all together, uh, we want to have a way at the plan level to represent these single actions so that we uh, can, the clinical people can mark them off. I did this or I didn't do this and when clinical shifts change, nursing shifts, or people go on holidays uh, from the clinical side, nobody forgets what's been done, what do we still have to do, where are we in the plan, who is taking care of this patient, and so on. And at the bottom level, what we spend most of our time on in open air is actually what we think of as clinical information, but it's really these top next two levels, plans and guidelines, under which is creating the um, sort of organising and controlling uh, principle from which information is created in the EHR. So just to say what we have today is a big mess of proprietary and pretty fragmented data, a little bit of representation of process in things like booking systems and so on, but what we really want is a picture of uh, a representation of those three levels, guidelines, planning, and the clinical information, which we could consider to be my own EHR, and well, those systems aren't going to go away, uh, not, certainly not quickly, so you need to be able to connect that EHR to those systems and also to the patient. But the idea here is that inside, or at least by reference from your own EHR, we have uh, plans now, not just data which are the results of observations or decisions or, um, or administrations of drugs. So basic reasons for clinical workflow and trying to build a specification for it, well team-based care is a, is a norm. Complexity is the big killer, so I spent a, a few years working at Intermountain Healthcare in the US with experts in this area and they identified complexity as the big the, it's the thing that you can't beat. No human, no matter how many medical degrees they might have, doesn't really do better than anybody else with this very famous seven plus or minus two uh, complexity limit. That is seven plus or minus two is, is about the uh, normal amount of uh, uh, separate, separate variables that humans can keep in our minds and keep track of. Now, if a complex condition like sepsis or acute respiratory distress syndrome, complex birth, whatever, has been identified by researchers as having uh, more like 20 or even 30 variables uh, at a time. So no, no human can keep track of those without some kind of um, help. 
We did look at existing approaches, so we, we did look at, at VPMN and uh, some other languages. I won't go into all of that, we can talk about it later if people want to. Um, but we did eventually decide after quite a long literature review that we would, we would, would actually write a new specification and uh, taking a lot from existing research and, uh, and so on. So here are some just typical use cases. Medication. If you think about routine uh, drug, administra drug administration, uh, we want timed administrations, that's taking the uh, chemotherapy example where there's uh, maybe a drug administration every day for a week, it will be typical in chemotherapy these days. So if you're giving drugs to a patient over a number of days, there are shift changes in the personnel. The oncology nurse that you had on Monday might be gone and you've got different people on the next part of the week and maybe somebody else on Friday. So the uh, medical staff, are not, not, it's not the same medical staff during the, during the day or during the week or over longer periods of time. So there's just a normal relatively um, or very standard chemotherapy drug regime and the highlighted bit just shows what the steps that we might want to represent, and we can imagine, this isn't a real screen, it's just a diagram I drew, so it's ugly, but you can imagine if there was a nicer representation on uh, in an actual application that would show for each of the drugs down the left-hand side, some symbols. So let's assume that these symbols have been established to be um, understandable by the, the clinical staff, and they want a way to uh, indicate that they've done it, or that they're doing it, or, or whatever. So. The general idea is that we're trying to uh, draw out the individual steps and enable, uh, enable the workers to know what they've done so far, what things remain to be done, and to um, indicate if they're doing it, or if it's underway, if it won't be done, uh, maybe it should be moved in time, they might have a clinical reason to do such things. Second case. Uh, acute ischemic stroke. So in this one, from the uh, guideline uh, I've studied with the research group at Intermountain Healthcare, they have, I think it's six different kinds of carers in the hospital that will deal with uh, a stroke patient. So it's time critical, as you understand with uh, stroke. You've got, you try to do everything you can or any, everything important within the first, I think it's three and a half hours or, or four hours. You have got handoffs between the different clinical personnel. There's imaging. There's somebody else who's going to decide what kind of therapy. It could be surgical. It could be um, uh, anticoagulation, etc. So you need to coordinate these workers so that when the imaging is finished, the other person gets the results as absolutely as fast as they can, and they can make the next decision. So I'll just show you a guideline, just to give you an idea of the complexity of what's in here. You can see. Uh, so that's emergency management of acute ischemic stroke. This is the one from Intermountain Healthcare, 2016. And if you start looking carefully, you'll see some decision pathways inside, little um, visual algorithms. Uh, look at the details. There's, there's nothing in this guideline that's put there just for fun. Every single line, every single um, number has a purpose. So it's about 18 pages long. Uh, it's got these little kinds of algorithms here for making certain types, types of decisions. You can just see the numbers of things that uh, come into the, the management uh, of that kind of patient in this guideline. Dozens of uh, uh, warnings and precautions you can see just below, below the middle heading there. It's, it seems unlikely that even a, you know, a very good hospital doctor will remember every, sing every single thing on here. And it keeps changing, because as I said before, research uh, discovers new things and various kinds of numbers or uh, contraindicated drugs or whatever it might be, those details will change. Even if you could memorize what was there today, it's probably going to be wrong in six months' time. That just lists the number of types of carers. So you've got the uh, the imaging tech, radiologist, nursing, uh, healthcare coordinator, uh, pharmacist, so there's a number of people that have to be coordinated. 
Here's a, so so the, the theme of that one is about coordination of members of a team. So just try to keep that in mind. Third use case uh, is uh, a decision support pathway to work out the best treatment for breast can uh, various kind of breast cancer. So I won't just to give you a picture. This is done as a BPMN picture, and if you follow the way through and uh, from the initial data that you have, you've got a lot of input variables in each box. So you can see on the far left hand side. Uh, let's see if I can make. So over here, it says consider a TNM. Uh, that's um, tumor node metastasis, just a cancer staging scoring system. And depending on whether that one says T less than 3, N less than 2, G less than 3, you go down this pathway, no prescribed chemotherapy. If the values are different on this box, you go into a pathway down here, and then you, there's more decisions to be made down here. So you get the general idea, right? The, the output is to figure out what are the treatments. So the blue boxes are possible treatments uh, following this through. So this is just a big decision pathway. There's a whole lot of other requirements. I'm not going to go into them because it would take too long and I need to be careful about time. You're going to, you're going to hit me. Yeah, I'll, so I, I can have 10 minutes more yeah. for the presentation. Then you have also 10 minutes for the questions. So you still have okay. to So I'm just going to give you a, I mean, I'll just mention the, the headline themes, but I'm not going to talk about them. So order sets, long-term treatments. I want a care plan maybe that's going to help manage a patient over a number of years. Uh, the checklist view, so the idea that it's good to have tasks that you can check off, even if it's mundane, obvious tasks. Tired workers forget to do some things, and a classic thing is that, uh, you know, if you forget to uh, sterilize something, maybe a patient is going to pick up an infection because a, a tired nurse or doctor forgot to wash his or her hands. Uh, adaptiveness, we need ability to skip tasks and cancel tasks and, and do those kinds of things. Uh, we, it's, we have to keep in mind that there's a difference between a task list for one worker and a task plan for a patient. So in some hospital IT systems there are task list systems that put the tasks for me who's a nurse. But if you think about it from the patient point of view, there, there can be a number of people working on that patient uh, at the time. So the task plan view is the patient-centric view. We can talk about maybe whether uh, we can put costing related information in there, etc. Anyway, so I'm just going to go into the design uh, concepts of our task planning specification in open air. We have focused on the bottom part, just trying to solve the plan question. We think that the primitives of the language that we've developed will probably work pretty well to represent care pathways, but I'm not going to make any claims right now until we've done more uh, testing and investigation. So a key thing to remember is, okay, if we had an ability to execute task plans, what, what we have, be, so imagine we don't have anything. What we have in reality is this yellow part down the bottom. That's the clinical environment with real people. This is where the real workflow is. So when we use the word workflow, I like to think about the real workflow actually is, is people and the patient and you know they've got a lot of machines in the room but it's actually people and what we have in our minds that is controlling what's going on. So we had a computer environment in and let's say that we have a, a workflow engine that can execute workflow definitions. It, this whole environment has to somehow try to stay in synchronization with reality and it's always going to be the case that the synchronization is, is imperfect. So we have to remember that what the computer knows is a, an attempt to, um, to know or to track what is going on in reality. They're not the same thing. Always worth keeping in mind because the uh, workflow engine isn't going to do anything um, like raise an alert if it doesn't have the information. And if you don't have a way of telling it the information, then it's never going to know. It can only work with what it knows. So we've aimed for executable task plans. It has to be executable. When I say executable, it means something that can execute inside an engine, communicate with real workers, and help them do the work that they're going to do. It's not going to do the work. It's not the doctor. It's just a, a coordinating and, and uh, 
uh, helping mechanism. So we like to think of it as a kind of co-pilot, like Waze in the car. I can drive, I know what I'm doing. Maybe I even remember the route, but it's going to start talking to me if, well, you can put it in different modes, but you know how those kind of things work. So we want a co-pilot that's going to help clinical workers do things that they would otherwise forget or that they can't remember in the case of those that complex guideline that I just showed you for stroke treatment. So here's an example. This one comes from uh, DIPS, which is a uh, Norwegian company doing open air. Uh, we have a visual language. It's, it's, not, it's got some similarities to BPMN, and we weren't trying to be specifically different to BPMN, but just to give you some high-level ideas of what is in our language. There's a work plan concept. So the top level construct is a work plan. So this example is outpatient, eye clinic encounter. The next level down, we consider that in general, the work plan has a number of task plans. Each task plan is the plan of work for one worker. So a work plan might have a number of workers. So the stroke example I just showed you will have, it was five or six different types of worker. So each task plan is this symbol here, and there's a, uh, a little person symbol to indicate what kind of person. So in this case, the patient is considered a kind of worker. The patient has a few things to do. Uh, this is the clinic administrator. So this overall uh, simple plan is a a patient attending an eye clinic. So I'll take you through a little bit of it, just to give you a feel for what this is. So the design of the visual language is, is made so that all of the visual symbols have direct semantics that can be, I mean, they're represented not as pictures, obviously, in the executable system, but if there's anything you see on there, there is a direct uh, equivalent in the semantic representation in the executable system. So we have a patient who attends the clinic, and you can I do this with the mouse, it's a bit easier. Um, so these boxes are tasks, as you might guess, tasks of some kind, so the patient's task is to attend a clinic. The red, oh, maybe, oh, I'll go back to this. The red ball means it's a stopping condition, a waiting condition. What are we waiting for? Uh, well, actually, both the clinic administrator, administration, and the patient are waiting for a very simple event, just a calendar event, what, what is the date time of this particular appointment. When that happens, that's going to make the uh, task become available and doable by the worker. So the task here, uh, when uh, that time event occurs, is that the appointment will be opened. Now it might be that it's opened automatically in some sort of local system or it might be opened by a worker typing something on a screen. I mean, you, you have to consider these details, which we didn't in this. Uh, but actually, we don't know if the patient's turned up, so the next task is a very simple one, receive and record patient. What's, what's the stopping condition or the wait condition? Well, the patient has to physically turn up. Just because we got to the right uh, date and time of the appointment doesn't mean the patient's there. So the patient turning up enables the patient to be received. The next task is for the patient to be passed to the consultation room. And you can see a symbol here, which is um, what we call a callback. And uh, you'll see where it goes to the next slide and goes to case review. So it's a new worker, it's a nurse, and uh, the role is to perform case review. So that nurse will receive um, and retrieve the EMR, that's the first task. But there's a wait condition on that. That's only gonna happen when the patient is you know, uh, called from the room. Probably the nurse is dealing with some other patients. So the general idea is that a lot of tasks are going to have wait conditions and different types of events that can fire the condition and make the task able, available to be performed. Another task, review eye function, so that specialist nurse is going to review the patient's eye function. And so here's a decision uh, box, and this little dot here means one path out of many, and it could be return to reception, nothing needed, or it could be passed to the doctor. 
And if, it's, if the decision is passed to the doctor, there's a little bit more workflow, and the, uh, there's, a, so there's a little task plan here for the actual uh, ophthalmologist specialist, and same thing again, some tasks, and they will eventually pass back the patient to the desk at the front. So that's a very, very boring, it's not particularly interesting from a clinical point of view, it's just to show some of the basic um, uh, primitives in the language. Now, we can do a lot more things in the language. I just wanted to give you a feel. There's now a tool which uh, has got uh, a visual modeling mode. It's the archetype designer uh, from Moran, now called Better, so it's a company in Slovenia that some of you would have heard of that's been doing open air implementations for a long time. So they have a tool that has this visual language in there. You can find the specification. Um, I'll just see if I can. I'll finish in a second. I'm just going to try and show you the visual modeling language just to give you an idea of all of the primitives in the language. So work. Work plan and task plan, that's the top level primitives. Actually, there's a whole lot of different metadata items to do with what care pathways and clinical indications and all kinds of things, as you might expect. Uh, these are different types. These are just grouping mechanisms. You can have tasks in parallel or in series, sequential. You can mix them up. We have um, different types of logic um, similar to uh, you know, what you've seen in, you would know from BPMN. We have weight states. Uh, as I've showed some examples there, we have conditional structures. So something that works like an if statement with various types of variables uh, and whether a variable um, or a Boolean expression is true, it means you go this path, otherwise this path, otherwise another path. There's one that looks a bit like a case statement, a programming case statement. So a variable value like systolic blood pressure, if it's larger than 100, go down this pathway, uh, etc. There's an event group, so it's, a, it's sort of a, a when-then structure. Depending on which event finds you follow a different path. So we have a lot of different variations of tasks, directly performable tasks, tasks that have a subplan with a little plus a dispatchable task, it means handing off to another clinician, so the engine knows that it's going to do some sort of notifications and communication between uh, workers. So you can see across the top here, there are different variants. Uh, I won't go into this, we don't have enough time, but there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of variants, as you can see, when you work out all of the combinations. Um, this one down here is uh, a dispatchable task type, which is external request to an external system, which um, isn't in the computing environment of the workflow engine. So it's, it could be a phone call or uh, just old uh, another type of communication to get some particular work done. And here are the event types which can trigger the wait states. So timing events, um, a timeline moment. So for example, if you, if you hit the, the two-day mark inside a task plan, then that will create an event and uh, state triggers, so that's if, for example, systolic blood pressure is, becomes over 160. So as you can imagine, you, the system has to have access to these variables. There has to be a way of uh, the values being input to the system so that it, it can know to generate a trigger. Uh, manual notification is if a person just maybe receives a result in their hands and they just have to press something on the screen to tell the system that this has been received. Maybe a, a scan result is ready. Other to tasks that have been done or aborted or completed, that, that's an event and that might have an effect later in the workflow. Uh, we can have delays. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a, a callback idea. Now, in the short amount of time we have here, of course I can't explain everything here. I think anybody who's done anything with anything like YAWL, which is yet another workflow language, that's actually the closest language that this one has uh, a correspondence to. There's a lot of correspondence with BPMN as well, so you probably understand generally what kinds of things are here. 
we focus very heavily on adaptiveness and um, being able to deal with exceptional cases. I didn't really show much of that because, uh, again, it's, it's a complex area. So this is just giving you a flavor of uh, what we've done in our in a, this specification. So I'm going to stop there. Do we have time for questions? A couple yeah. of questions, maybe? Yeah, probably we have six minutes, so we have some time for... Um, Anybody with a six-minute question? question? <laughs> It's been, I, I have, uh, have read through this, I know about this uh, that's planning for your work. And uh, uh, in, the, in the case of Pothos Mine, uh, Pothos Mine usually is, usually people know more about the discovery part. Yeah. Taking the events, we can have these kind of models. Now these are uh, new ideas of applying interactive technologies yeah. in order to choose the expert knowledge to make to support the, pro the discovery process. Yep. So imagine you are in the, in, in the middle of the discovery and you have some actions that you can uh, make semantic <coughs> information on that. Because in, in, in process mining, most of them, uh, these, are, these are activities there are activities in the law, but, and they have his semantics. But if, if the expert can offer these semantics to the, these events, we can use that in order to improve the discovery in a more understandable way. But in that case, if you have also the task plan made, the interesting thing in that case is uh, conformal checking techniques. What is conformal checking techniques? We have the general plan, and you, we have the lot of the instance of the log of the instance. The idea is what is the deep distance between the log and the real, and the ideal task plan. And we have a lot of technologies in order to make this distance. Yeah, so I mean, I didn't even try to talk about process mining. He's way more expert than I am on it, for one thing. Uh, but we have put some things in there with uh, the idea of generating what some people call the digital exhaust or the kind of uh, the record of things happening. So in this standard, there's actually some, uh, some constructs to record every single uh, state change of a task, every single action that's taken. But of course, as, as the work plan happens in reality, as clinical workers do their, their work, and maybe they click something on the screen, the normal things that happen in an open air system are still happening. So an action is recorded, an observation is recorded. So the fully detailed observation of an ECG result or a, you know, blood pressure or whatever it is. So there's actually two type of uh, digital exhaust. One is coming straight from the workflow engine. It's a kind of mechanical generation of, of um, hopefully well formatted log events that could be uh, used for basis process mining. Uh, but you can treat, I mean the EHR is a kind of digital exhaust of just work being done. And if you have an indic, we now can have an indicator in any observation or action or diagnosis or anything else that's in the record that says what uh, task plan task caused this to be done, if, if there was a, an actual planned uh, task. <coughs> uh, of course, I didn't even talk about authoring and what's the whole mentality of authoring and design of these things, because that's a huge topic itself. So um, uh, what I would say, that I look forward to actually you know, doing more research, potentially with, with uh, some of you guys here, which would be fantastic to get this uh, in, a, in a system, in a, a bigger environment, an ecosystem, where we close the loop between doing and process mining and learning and uh, improving guidelines over time. We have time maybe for one short question. <laughs> no questions? Okay, I will, I will use this time for one uh, question. So it's about, I don't know if you've already faced, or maybe you will face in the future, to deal with uh, multimorbidities, and, and if you can, if, if you face it, if you can speak about this problem, because it's something that is uh, always mentioned in all the literature about the big issue when dealing with uh, workflow management and clinical guidelines, etc. Yeah, well, all I can say is that I mean, I, I ask questions actually of um, experts at Intermountain Healthcare, and they're one of the centers of excellence in the U.S. And so the basic problem, at least one way of understanding the basic problem, is, like I said before in the presentation. 
human being is a phenotype, it's its own personal phenotype, and usually there's a whole bunch of things happening to you. If I have diabetes, and then I also have sepsis, and you know, maybe I'm pregnant, I'm really unlucky, uh, so there's more things happening, or a number of things happening at the same time. Guidelines tend to be written for a single model condition, just as if you had sepsis, but you were otherwise healthy. Well, if you've got sepsis, you're not very healthy. But and then a complicated pregnancy, it's, it's just like you've only got complicated pregnancy. So this doesn't happen in real life. The experts at Inner Mountain, their view is that we actually don't have uh, good science at the moment for how to merge these guidelines. Because you can imagine, imagine we had a diagram like this for three different guidelines that could potentially apply to the one patient. There's no algorithm that is, at least according to the experts that I've known, and at least you know, my research group over there has, we haven't found anything that says how you could merge these uh, different things. And in fact, what you find, if you, if you examine guidelines carefully, you'll see, uh, especially guidelines for complicated conditions like uh, ischemic stroke, it's got its own defense mechanism against other guidelines and against other things happening in the patient's body. So they're full of contraindications. Do this, except if the patient has had recent heart surgery in the last, last three months. Do this, except if the patient has raised troponin. Do this, and you know, uh, if, if the patient is taking any of these drugs, go this way. If they're taking some other drugs, go this way. So the guidelines are written to try and be safe. Obviously, the writers, they understand medically what they're doing, and they're conscious of the reality that there can be comorbidities. But if you think about it as a computational problem, you would, each of these guidelines has what I think of as, as its own defense system to try to prevent the clinicians making a bad mistake. So it tries to mention other comorbidities, and, and they've tried to think of all the things that could be, uh, have dependencies or interactions with this guideline. So that's where we are. Now, to change that, to get to a more scientific approach where you could merge guidelines somehow, maybe even in a machine way, I think we're a long way from that. It's going to be a very interesting uh, journey to try and figure out how to do it. So, okay, so it's uh, time to see. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was a very interesting presentation.